Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, it's today taken from the epistle for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. And I took those that, that sentence there because in addition to it being the, just the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, it's also a beautiful feast day, which is that of the humility of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our Lady, in her entire life, exemplifies this great virtue of, of humility. She does so perfectly, and we see it time and time again throughout the scriptures, her living this, this perfection of humility. We see it in the Annunciation, when she, when she humbly submits herself to the will of God to accept the, the, the duty of being the mother of the Messiah. We see it in her visitation when she hustles away very quickly without any thought to herself to take care of the duty of caring for St. Elizabeth. We see that, <clears throat> that in this humility and subjecting our Lord to the circumcision, being obedient to the law, to her flight in Egypt without questioning, leaving in the middle of the night to, to go away to save the, the child's life. And we also see it in her own subjection to the sufferings uh, that she endured spiritually in the passion of our Lord. This is just scratching the surface to show uh, that great humility that she possessed all the time, every moment of her life. We also know that it isn't simply a virtue for Our Lady. She is not the only one that has to practice humility. But it's actually for each and every single one of us. When we look at the saints, every saint that came before us was humble. That's what makes them saints in the end. And it is of our Lord that he tells us that we have to practice this virtue. And he says, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So, if we have to be striving for humility, then I think it behooves us to have a better understanding of exactly what that virtue is, because it is a virtue that I find is more misunderstood in the minds of people than any of the other ones. More often is there are mistakes made in what the understanding of it means to be humble than it is to, say, be charitable or to uh, be prudent and, 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 you know, and all the rest, because it's, it is something that, in a way, is a bit confusing. So that's what we're going to do today, is understand better humility and the need for it. St. Bernard defines humility as a virtue by which a man, knowing himself as he truly is, abases himself. To know ourselves is not to know ourselves in the way that I view myself. It's not to, to, to know myself in the way that other people talk of me. It's not to say that, oh, well, people seem to generally like me, so I must be a pretty good person. Or I think I do all right, I try, and, and therefore, you know, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm all right. Or perhaps the, the reverse, people seem to be complaining about me all the time, so perhaps I'm just this wretch of a, of a human being. No. None of those are actually humility. But humility is to know ourselves and where we stand in relation to God. Because that's where it actually matters, and that's where truth lies, is in that relation of ourselves in that comparison with the Almighty. And it's for this reason that we abase ourselves, that we that we look down upon ourselves in a way that we that we subject ourselves to constant acts of humiliation because we can never, ever measure up to the divine. We are creatures. We are always going to be less than the good God. And because of that, there's always room for us to grow, to improve, to, and to get closer to Him. We have our own faults and failings. We have those areas which are imperfect. St. Bernard says, because we never... Uh, be, because we never truly measure up to God, it's for this reason that we can grow. And 
in this understanding of humility, we see why humility is not just <coughs> suggested, it is not just something to be arbitrarily strived after, but humility is actually necessary in order to save our souls. In uh, St. James' epistle, he writes, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The exercise of the virtue of humility moves all of our actions to follow God's will. And so therefore, it is truly connected in following the divine plan. It's through humility that we find that necessary balance in our lives. Let's explore that a little more. So how do we follow that, that explanation of humility in our lives? And why does it move, and how does it move, our actions? In the first place, true humility is there to restrain our actions. More often than not, man is naturally tending to have a too high of an, ex of, of an esteem and an opinion of ourselves. We're too often looking past our own faults in order to justify our actions to looking for the approval of those around us. And it's this pride and this type of pride that, uh, that if we allow it to take place and don't exercise humility, it will dominate our lives. How does that happen? Well, first, if we allow this pride to, to happen, we will exaggerate our own abilities. We'll, we'll think so highly of ourselves that we think that we're the best at whatever we do, or that we do think we look at it at our own actions and say, "Wow, gee, I really did that well, and I'm going to pat myself on the back for that." Or I should let everybody else around me know how well I am at X, Y, or Z, because I'm in a way exaggerating my own capabilities, my own abilities, and that is out of line with that virtue of humility. Secondly, we look down upon our neighbor if we have this pride. Because of the fact that we've exalted ourselves so high in our own mind, it's an automatic reaction for us to find the fault in those around us. We look and see the things that everybody else does wrong because I refuse to look at my own faults and failings. I refuse to look at the things that I need to do to grow. And so I have to find fault in something. It's not going to be me. So therefore, it's going to be the people around me. Thirdly, we won't admit our own faults easily. This oftentimes comes in the way of excuses that are made. Excuses come so easily to our lips. Anytime someone offers some sort of correction, anytime we have to approach things like the sacrament of penance, we have this hesitation to just say what the reality is, that ugly truth of our own faults. We hesitate and try to gloss over it, or we try to explain the circumstances that go along with something. And rather than just simply accusing ourselves, of the fault that is at hand. We don't want to look at our own ugliness in that way by our faults and failings. And so, by our pride, we excuse them. By our pride, we gloss over them. By our pride, we minimize them in our own minds as a justification of our own wrongdoing so we don't have to have that self-reflection. Fourth, we will strive after things which are not proper or not attainable. In this, our pride acts in a way to search to gain things that we think are due to us when they're really not. Perhaps I think, because I have such a high opinion of myself, I deserve that promotion, or I deserve some sort of pat on the back or accolades for the things that I've done. Or perhaps I think that I need, I should obtain some sort of higher position in life because I have a disordered look upon my own abilities and think, 
well, you know, I, I do this so well, I should try to get to that next level, or I should go and try to get such and such a degree or such and such a, a promotion and strive after that inordinately because I think to myself, well, I'm, I'm so qualified for that. And so I strive after what is either not proper or what is not attainable for me. <clears throat> Fifthly, by pride, we will trust our own abilities rather than seeking the assistance both divine and from another. We trust in our own abilities, and so therefore we think that we have the solution to the problem, or we can cause ourselves to grow by our own actions, by our own, by our own strength. That we think that, you know, I don't have to ask for the graces to do something, or I don't even think to ask for the graces to do something in regards to my spiritual life, because I just have to try harder. I can do it, you know, if I just set my mind to it. Or I shouldn't go and talk to the priest for advice on something because, well, I'll just figure it out myself. Or I don't have to talk to, an, you know, an expert in, in, cert in certain fields because I just have the answers or I can find the answers and, and it's just a waste of my time to do so. It's equivalent to, you know, trying to climb Everest without the Sherpa as, a, as an analogy that I often use in, re in regards to those things. We can't pretend that we have the answers for ourselves, especially when it comes to our spiritual life. We can't pretend that we know how to solve all of our own spiritual problems because the examples of our lives, each and every one of us, shows that we don't have those answers readily available. That's why every one of us goes to confession on a regular basis because we fall time and time again. Yes, it's because of our, of our, of our human weakness, but it's also linked to our ability, our, our, unwillingness to search for advice and help. You know, a, a priest never acts as his own spiritual director. He never acts as his own advisor in his own spiritual life because he knows that he can't make those judgments objectively. Every one of us has to follow in that same way, that recognition that sometimes a little bit of advice and a little bit of humbling ourselves and going and following through with that advice goes a long way in helping us to grow. And there we find the ways to fight against our own faults and failures. If in the, that first place our humility will restrain actions in that overthinking of ourselves, sometimes a true humility is applied for the reasons of the opposite that we go in the opposite direction and we have what is known as a false humility, but it's really a, a, a part of pride, that we think so lowly of ourselves that we fall into pride in that way. Because humility prevents us from, from despair. It prevents us from looking down upon ourselves in an inordinate manner. It keeps us, just like everything that St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how moderation is the road, is the, is the pathway to sanctity. Well, humility is a perfect example of that. On the one hand, it restrains our actions from overreaching. But on the other hand, it keeps us from that level of despair of the good things that we have. For example, firstly, we recognize by our humility, we will be able to recognize our own gifts that we have in our lives, both natural and supernatural gifts, because these things are given to us by God. It would be wrong to deny that we are given gifts. God gives every single one of us certain gifts. They are not, they are not you know, universal. We don't receive every gift, but we do receive the gifts that we need in our lives to be able to continue that growth in our spiritual lives and to be able to perform the duties that we have. 
Some of us have certain talents. Some of us have certain uh, drawings that will help us in different area, aspects of our own piety. But it's each and every one of those things doesn't come from anything that I've done, but rather it comes because God has given me that as a gratuitous gift, but and he re expects me to use that gift. That's why it's there. If I deny it, then the gift is a waste. And God would never waste anything upon us. He's not, you know, everything he does is for an ultimate purpose. And so if he gives us a talent, if he gives us a gift, then he expects us to use it and use it well and use it for the ultimate achieving of his will and for his further glorification. Secondly, is that by this way, we recognize by humility that salvation and virtue are things that are attainable. That virtue of hope is directly correlated with the virtue of humility. Because if I have that false humility, which is based in pride, then I think that I'm so wretched of a sinner that I'm, it's impossible for me to be really virtuous. It's impossible for me to save my soul, or it seems so unattainable that I almost have this despair, as we talked about at the beginning, of the goods that are attainable in my life. I can strive to improve in every aspect of my life, and I can work to do so, and with God's help, I can grow in virtue, I can grow in grace, I can save my soul. That is the normal requirement of every single person here. We are all made for the purpose of saving our soul, and we all have the ability and the means to do so. No matter what we've done up to this point, we still have the ability to save our souls. It also prevents us from falling into envy because if we so look so lowly upon ourselves and we don't recognize our own gifts, then we're going to be given into the defaults of envy of another. We'll see their talents and their gifts and we think, wow, they just, you know, they just, everything falls into place for them and everything goes to pot for me. Or I'll think that I can never ever be able to be, uh, to do, to in any way please God like so and so does. Or I'm always going to be, you know, all my crosses just seem so much heavier than those of another. Or it's just virtue seems to come so easily to that person. And all of those, the, that, that mindset is a very damaging mindset. It's something that is so contrary to that virtue of humility that we have to always work to fight against that. And lastly, with that, it comes the avoidance of scruples. Scrupulosity is the thought that everything we do is is constantly wrong and i you know i take uh, you know uh, something that's not sinful and it ha I, I just have to have done it wrong so it must be sinful or i have some sort of light fault and therefore well i i know i've offended god so every offense against god is is uh, is is evil and so therefore it must be a mortal sin and so that scrupulosity prevents us from ever growing because it constantly beats us down and it constantly fights against this very virtue of humility. In, in accordance with humility, it also serves another purpose in our lives. So it finds that balance between the two extremes, but it also allows us by that virtue to fulfill our duties, the things God does require of us, and to do them well. Because it allows us to recognize in our lives the duties of our state and our position, and also allows us to humbly submit ourselves to those who have a lawful authority over us. We have to recognize, in order to save our souls, of course, that God is the ultimate of all the authorities. There is no higher authority. There is no. He is the creator, and he is the reason why we, are, we, we have life itself. We owe everything to him. And if we have any hope of redemption, it is because of him. 
And so we constantly recognize him as the highest authority who I have to serve first and foremost above all else, no matter what the consequences of that are. It also helps me to recognize certain rights and duties for other areas of life in certain offices. For instance, parents. Parents command a respect and an honor from their children. It's not because they, as individuals, are worthy of such things, but it's their office as a parent that commands those things. God has given them certain rights and privileges as parents regarding their children. Children are responsible for obeying their parents. They're responsible for treating them kindly, to speaking to them kindly, to having proper manners and speech about their parents and in interaction with their parents. And parents have the right to correct it when that is not given and have a duty to correct when it's not given. And thus, that proper hierarchy of the family is established and maintained because it is part of God's will and it is a necessity for on each end the rights and the duties pertaining to parents in their relationship to children. It also pertains to rulers and their offices. You know, people of, of authority come and go and they, to varying degrees, will have certain, you know, uh, accolades and, and detriments to their character and to the way they carry out their office. But if they validly possess an office, we have to give honor and deference to them because of their office. And with their office comes certain aspects of, of respect that they, that they command, just like a parent does. And with their office also come certain benefits to them in their life because they have a higher duty to them. For instance, a king would, would, you know, part of their office is that they have the regal attire and the regal uh, implements. So, you know, it's not wrong for a king to have a crown with jewels and a, and a scepter with, you know, with, made out of gold and, and gems and to have, you know, a palace and things like that, because that's all part of the things given to his office in order for him to carry out and to, to present the symbolism of that authority which ultimately comes from on high. And so while it might be lavish for any one of us to possess such treasures, on the part of the, uh, the ruler of a kingdom, it is not. It, sh it, it shows their status as ruler in that regard. Also, priests to their people, because of their office, have a certain honor that is, is due to them in that regard. Uh, it would be wrong of me to ignore that office in, in talking when talking about humility, because it requires, just like any of the other positions of, of authority, it requires a humility both on the part of the priest and on the part of the people. People, but out of their humility, they listen to the priest. They, they, they give deference to them. They give honor to the priest because of his office. You know, it's, it's not because of me as a man that people stand up when upon the entering of, of, into the room of a priest, but because of my office that, that it happens. Because that's a proper sign of, of respect and given that is given. And it's not because, you know, I enjoy people kissing my hand during sacred ceremonies but because it is, a, it is an honor given for the office of the priesthood in showing the sacredness of the actions of the sacrifice of the Mass or, or the sacred liturgy, that those things take place. And so, on my part, I'm, I humbly go along with those, with those customs and accept them, whether they're enjoyable or not. And for the part of the servers of the, of the liturgy, they they do them out of that honor and deference, or on part of the people, you know, that the listening to, uh, to the advice given and giving proper speech and, and respect to the office is something that is directly tied with that office as an altar Christus, another Christ, not because an individual as a man deserves it, but because that comes from God on high. So, with humility, it will also aid us in increasing 
in the ultimate of virtues that our Lord explains to us, and that is of charity. Humility is directly linked to charity, and as our Lord said, charity reigns supreme, and that it is the whole of the law and the prophets. And by regarding, how, so how does it do this? First off, by being humble, we recognize God's infinite goodness, and as that of the infinitely good God, we know that we have to love and serve him in our lives. We have to try to, to always increase in our love and service of him each and every day. We also know by our humility that it will help us to see the virtues in our neighbor, having that recognition that in order to have charity, first is the love of God, and second is that love of neighbor, that we should always be looking to find the virtue in those around us and never finding their faults. And lastly, that humility will help us to recognize our own faults, but not in a way of sullenness or downtroddenness, but in a way to drive us to continually work for these other two areas. Because I have to be able to recognize my faults in order to serve God better. Because it's only by overcoming them that I please Him. And I have to be able to recognize my own failings in the area of charity towards my neighbor in order to be able to increase and grow to be more charitable towards him. Humility is truly the key to our own spiritual growth. We will work at our own faults by this virtue. We will work at our own spiritual life. We will use our spiritual gifts well. We will perform our duties well. And when we increase in all these aspects of our life because of this one virtue, in the end, we will get closer to our ultimate reward in heaven. God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.